crowd like this is always super inspiring and rewarding and brings me so much joy. And it's especially the case in the COVID era where I walk around a store without a mask or something and people are like running up out of the aisle and turning around. So it's great just to relate to my fellow human beings in, in this way. So I want to thank Jack for inviting me and for putting this on. This is absolutely awesome. I know I can tell he's getting just as much out of it as all of you guys are. He's like a big kid, and this is a giant sleepover at his house. <laughs> so uh, today I want to talk to you guys about the Freedom Cell Network. And my goal for this conversation is to educate you guys about how it works, its benefits, and hopefully inspire folks that haven't joined the network yet to join, to get further organized. And for those that have joined, I want to want you guys to hopefully feel inspired and motivated and start taking yeah, some massive better. action so we can help build this thing together. Because this is the type, type of group that I definitely want to have in, in my network. Too much. We all are, we are part much. of the network, so it's super, like just super good stuff. I also want to overcome yeah, some objections. Really One of the thing. biggest objections to the Freedom Cell Network is yeah. I don't want to be on a list. <laughs> or I heard from some of my wife, You're we want to do it, but my wife's yeah. concerned. So just to get that out of the way, if we're all on a list, then there is no list. And just like having a gun, it's better to have a network of people that got your back and not need it than it is to need the network and not have it. And whether you're in a radical network like the Freedom Cell Group or not, or the Survival Podcast, Member Support Brigade, or this whole crowd here, government tends to harm people and hurt people whether they're doing that kind of stuff or not. So I think it's really important in this day and age. I want to kind of put this conversation in the context of, uh, of a duality. So the Freedom Cell Network is extremely beneficial in a defensive posture, so as to insulate ourselves and protect ourselves, not only from the tyranny that we're all familiar with and have experienced perhaps or studied, but also a really nasty new technological surveillance tyranny that's coming down the pike. So I want to talk about the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and so Freedom Cell Network has expanded immensely since COVID popped off. And a lot of that is because of this defensive action. But more importantly, I want to share that we as human beings, we deserve better than government, right? Uh, government, I think, is a dated idea. I think it's obsolete. It doesn't serve the people unless you're that tiny little group in power, the ruling class. And so I want to just help I want you guys to help me, and I want us together to manifest a better way to organize ourselves as human beings. We're social animals, and this top-down, coercive, centralized way of doing things is not serving us anymore. In fact, it never has been. So let me go live on here. I didn't do that. Live for the FBI to make sure they can tap in. Make it easy on I'm them. talking about you. Work. Maybe they'll learn something. Okay, so the Freedom Cell idea came to me in 2014. I've been an activist for liberty and truth and researching conspiracies and libertarianism since 2012. And I spent several years doing political activism, starting with the Ron Paul campaign, even before that did some ACLU stuff on college campus. And I had such an admiration for freedom, and I so strongly desired a genuinely free society, not a half measure, not even minarchism or a limited constitutional government, which would definitely be preferable than what we have now. I want total freedom where people can live their lives according to their own ends. So I started thinking, what does that look like? I was so dissatisfied with the political activism. We had, there's an organization that I helped to found, Texans for Accountable Government, in 2008 it was. And that group is still around to this day, focused a lot about privacy, civil liberties, police accountability. And we had some victories, what would seem like victories. For example, the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration was going to give federal grant money to the Austin Police Department to train them as phlebotomists to do blood withdrawals on the side of the road if they pull you over and suspect you of DWI. So we fought back on that. We dressed up as vampire cops and paraded around downtown in the school <laughs> local theater. And we got a resolution introduced at the local level that would have stopped that from happening, stopped them from being trained. Well, at the 11th hour, the city attorney's like, no, this isn't legal because there's a state law that says law enforcement shall use all lawful means. So we can't take away their lawful means because this isn't illegal, therefore it's lawful. 
really what that law means is that they should use only lawful means. They shouldn't use illegal means to carry out their duties. So they kind of gutted it. But at the end of the day, we stopped the police officers from being trained as phlebotomists. They just got the phlebotomists to do the blood withdrawal in their little mobile, their little mobile DWI testing center. And so that may have seemed like a victory, but in reality, it wasn't any steps forward towards more freedom in our lives. We were simply slowing the growth of tyranny. So in all the time and energy, resources, money it took to take this little baby step, not forward, it was just slowing. Instead of four steps backward, it was two. It wasn't satisfying for me. So I started thinking and exploring what can we do. And along this time, I was getting into alternative institutions. Before cryptocurrency, the mother of my kids and I would go to uh, farmer's markets and encourage the vendors to accept silver dimes in exchange for their goods, right? And we had like 120 chickens at one point. We would uh, offer chickens for a dime a dozen. And then that silver dime was like two bucks. And we we're like, oh, maybe, maybe we'll back away from this. <laughs> Occasionally, we'd come across a, a vendor that would be like, oh, silver dimes, of course I will. That Federal Reserve is raping us good, man. <laughs> There's a lot of good people out there when you strike up conversations. And so I wanted to explore alternative institutions. And I knew there was a lot of people that didn't want to participate in government, that wanted to opt out to varying degrees. We call these people agorists, right? Revolutionary market anarchism. But one of the things that holds people back myself included, is the fear of violence, harm, having your property taken away. And so I started to really center in on the importance of strength in numbers, right? The lone wolf sitting duck that's out there, the Irwin Schiff, for example, or the guy that's going at it alone, evading his taxes, disobeying regulations in the business, it's easier for him to get crushed. But what if there was 1,000 people? What if there was 10,000 people? What if there was 100,000 people that were ready and willing to opt out together? And not just to opt out, right? Because that's more of the defensive language, but more importantly, just to do our own thing. Like what we're doing here today, right? There's no violence, there's no coercion. Nobody's forcing anyone to do anything. And it's a very beautiful, harmonious thing. So I would like to replicate what we experience here today on a bigger scale, right? Whether it's us living together in intentional <coughs> communities on big 100-acre properties, or the folks that have the 15 acres here or the three acres here were networked in a confederation of like-minded agorist cadres. So that's what the Freedom Cell Network is all about. In 2014, it was just an idea. I had an inner cadre group, but it fell apart because of infighting, which is why I'm hyper-conscious of group dynamics and how to overcome that and communication tactics. But at that point, um, I had two kids, and I was an impoverished activist. There was actually a nonprofit that worked well for a year or so that I was working with, but I was going at it alone. And I shifted away from the activism and the front facing and doing radio news and podcasts and kind of went back to my business and to take care of my family. Well, fast forward, a good friend of mine, Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance Network, he took the idea and just ran with it and exploded it and turned it into a global network. So this really cool website we see behind us. And then when COVID happened, my business was doing well, and since COVID happened, my business has continued to do well, which just shows, like, if you have the momentum, if you have the right mindset, you can create your own economy that's not dependent on the state of the economy outside of you. And so I had the opportunity to get back into it, and by now, the group was growing. When I started getting back into activism in this regard and promoting it, there was like a 1,000 people, and I remember we'd be like, we hit 2,000, we hit 3,000, now we have over 6,000 people participating. So it's not just an idea, it is a living organism, a living society. And essentially what we're trying to do is create our own free society while the existing framework crumbles around us. And so, let me just show you real quick how cool this is. So we're in, this is the member map. I strongly invite everyone to sign up on the website at freedomcells.org. Remember, if we're all on the list, there is no list. <laughs> All these people are on this list here. It's a lot of people. So these, each one of these dots represents a member that's participating in the network. And so if you can see, as you can see, the network here in Texas is pretty damn strong. Houston has a whole lot of people. That's where Derek Rose is from. There's Central Texas right there. DFW is definitely leading the way. There's a really strong couple groups over out east. And, um, what's that? Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee's doing good too. And so one of the things I want to do at the end is uh, get folks to kind of congregate in their area. 
Nicole set up a Tennessee Telegram chat. There's a Greater Texas Telegram chat. There's also a DFW area Telegram chat. So I want us to go away working together to organize, right? Because there's a network here and a community here, but one of the things that we offer with the Freedom Cell Network is this really great organizational structure, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Here, let me pull over to Tennessee real quick. Where is she going too far north here? There's Kentucky. There's Tennessee right there. So there's a pretty good amount of people there too. So the cool thing about the website, you go on, you put your address or an address at the park down, maybe don't put your home address, but the park down the road or the coffee shop down the road, and then you can see and link up with people. And here's the catch. If there's no one in your area, people are like, there's no one in my area. You guys aren't doing a good enough job. But really the, what that means is that we need you to be a leader and help find other people in your area. Okay, so let me talk about where things are right now and where things are going, right? Because there's a lot of talk in this community about collapse and stuff. I should say the title of this talk is Freedom Cells, Living Free If Times Get Bad or Even If They Don't. <laughs> so there's a lot of talk about collapse. And uh, back in 2006 is when I started focusing on collapse a lot and was like all freaked out, and sketched out, need to bug out. The economy's going to collapse. Well, a couple years later, it didn't collapse, but it was a shit show. And I always remember something stuck with me. I told my dad, you got to get your money out of the stock market. It's going to collapse. you got to get into gold and silver. And he said, John, I can go up in the attic and grab a book, How to Profit from the Upcoming Collapse. It was written in 1978. And that really stuck with me. It's like, maybe I'm exaggerating. <laughs> and I realized, like, it's all part of the same collapse. It's just kicking the can down the road. And one of these days, the chicken's going to come home to roost. That's what I thought. Now I have a different theory that I'm going to share with you. <clears throat> so we deserve better. The status quo of a centralized government, especially a strong federal government, all the way in Washington, D.C., whether it's Trump or Biden or whoever the president, this isn't an ideal way to live. And I'm sure, folks, if you're on social media, you recognize there's a whole lot of division and hate and nastiness. And I know we're not that ridiculous, but there's like families that are being broken apart because one supports Trump, one supports Biden. Everybody's all worked up. And one of the reasons for this is that we have a system where it's like one size fits all. This group gets in power and they force their views on everyone else. This group's in power, they force their views on everyone else, whether you agree with it or not. It doesn't work. Not to mention, there's an income tax that usurps money from everyone, except for the agorists, like our buddy Sal. And it uses it to fund a really violent military war machine that's not a defensive or protect freedom thing. It's a hegemony, multinational corporation, international bankers. We have a police state that's growing increasingly scary at home. And there's this crazy left-right thing where the, my Ron Paul crew that was like the Department of Homeland Security, we're like 9-11 truthers. The Department of Homeland Security is basically the Gestapo. Fast forward several years and they're like, Hell yeah, Trump, send in the Department of Homeland Security paramilitary <laughs> forces to go suppress these protests. It's like, wait a second, hold on now. There's a lot of nastiness going on, and there's like this creeping threat of communism, and we're like just checking off planks in the Communist Manifesto in this country. So that's what things are now. And it's not just the federal government. The state and local governments are extremely onerous as well. Even here in Texas, which is relatively free compared to some other places, Tennessee is a relatively free state, as is Florida. But... I'm not looking to compare myself to North Korea. Like everyone's like, you want, you don't like this country, then why don't you go to North Korea or whatever? It's like, no, that's not, that's setting the bar kind of low. I didn't think that. <laughs> what we have with the United States constitutional experiment, I think is setting the bar low too. I'm not a big fan of the Constitution. A lot of people think it created this great environment for freedom to flourish. I'm a bigger fan of the Declaration of Independence and the original rebels. But the group of people that signed the Constitution, a lot of them were bankers, lawyers, aristocrats, elitists. And really what they did was create the largest central government that's ever existed. And because you have that relative economic freedom, it's managed, it's created an environment where the government can extract a whole lot of resources to do all sorts of dirty, nasty things. So already things are bad. But I'm not going to say they're getting worse. They're going to get worse for some people, but not us, because we're going to carve our little sovereignty out of there. So I'm going to share about, a little bit about Agenda 21 and the Great Reset. And these are some of the reasons why the Freedom Cell Network is more important now than ever and why it's exploded in popularity and interest, right? Who's familiar with Agenda 21? Okay, cool. A lot of folks are. That's great. Uh, Agenda 21 is a document that was signed 
1992 at the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It essentially is a document that leverages concerns about environmentalism and sustainability in order to dramatically shift the way people are governed, the way businesses operate. It wants to use sustainability in order to enact all sorts of controls. Now here's the problem with these United Nations guys in the World Economic Forum, I'll talk about it in a sec. A lot of their writing makes it seem all peachy and it has this nice veneer, like it's so much a beautiful thing. How can we possibly be against sustainability, right? This is real sustainability over here, not this bogus corporate top-down stuff. So that's Agenda 21. One of the things that came out of Agenda 21 was this concept of the Wildlands Project, yep. where they want humans to be herded into compact cities, and the Wildlands Project has this map. Someone did a simulation of what it would be like. All the humans are in these compact cities that are black dots. And they want to rewild the Earth, a significant portion of the population. They want 30% of the Earth to be off limits to humans. That's just a start. That's what they want to do by 2030. 30% 30 by 2030. 2030 is a huge year I'm going to talk about, which means we need to really get it together because we they're going to shift the way the world operates, so are we, right? And so those areas are off human use, so there's going to be public transportation that connects everything, right? Agenda 21 wants to dramatically alter the concept of private property, essentially eliminating it altogether. Uh, they want to implement carbon taxes and cap and trade and create use carbon as a currency, essentially, or a financial instrument. People bet on carbon emissions and the company can do this or that. So that's Agenda 21. More recently, they updated it to Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. This has already been taking place. George H.W. Bush signed off on it, yep. and he's about as insider as it gets. Former CIA, his family, his grandfather, Prescott Bush, or his dad was involved in the Nazi movement, all sorts of stuff. International bankers are all tied in. Um, it wasn't ratified by the Senate, right? And so what a lot of these globalists do, right? I've, I've been a student of the conspiratorial view of history for quite some time. And what they do is they recognize they, they can't go direct, just we're going to totally usurp the Constitution, we're going to take over the country, right? They're not visible with their stuff, although it is an open conspiracy because you can read it and research it. What they do is they do an end run around and instead of going to the federal government or the Congress to pass legislation, like the Green New Deal, which is the essence of Agenda 21, they go to local governments. Like there's this group called the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, and they get local governments to buy into stuff. They used to call it Local Agenda 21, but there's this document from 2005, and it's giving these sustainability people advice. And they're like, we used to call it Local Agenda 21. But then we get John Birch Society people and conservatives and militia types that were all upset about it. So now we call it comprehensive planning. <laughs> That's what they do. And so this is all in the works, right? And we see this coming to being, and there's all sorts of pressure and all sorts of legislation that's getting passed, and not just legislation, but like codes and edicts and stuff. So that's already going down. Well, now there's this new concept of the Great Reset. Who's heard of the World Economic Forum's Great Reset? Yep. So essentially, all it is is a pretty sophisticated marketing plan to change the way the world works. And one of the big things about the Great Reset is called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, right? So you had the, the factories and technology and information, this evolution of commerce and business and capitalism. Well, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is the economies of technology merging with biology. One of the concepts is called surveillance capitalism where data will be traded, where just about every single aspect of our lives will be tracked and traced. This is where we see social credit scores coming into play. And oftentimes what takes place in communist China is essentially like a proving ground for how to roll it out with the rest of the world, as is Australia and New Zealand. But thankfully, we got some really brave guys over here holding it down in Australia. So like, we think it's tough for us to do this kind of stuff here. Imagine being these guys. Yeah. Now, there was at one point a little bitty dot in North Korea, but then all of a sudden it vanished for some reason. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> there was never a dot in North Korea. Maybe someday. <laughs> so, the Great Reset. To get an idea of what they want, this is the World Economic Forum. They're the guys that meet every year in Davos, right? They're called yeah. like the Davos Superclass. All these oligarchs that really care about the little guy. And they use sustainability as one of their buzzwords. 
and they use poverty. They really want to help out poverty. But they're like billionaire, super class type folks. So this is one of their propaganda pieces from their website. This stuff comes out on their website, but they also get it in Washington Post and stuff. So listen how nice this sounds. The title is, Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. <laughs> this is their website. So check it out. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free. No such thing as a free lunch. So it ended up not making sense for us to own much. Wow. And so for a lot of, I like to use this for people that are like, that sounds like a conspiracy. They don't want to have this panopticon surveillance society and take away our private property rights. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what they want to do. And their big goal is 2030. I did an interview with this woman who was a professor at Tulsa University. There's a really strong freedom cell network in the Tulsa area. And she learned at her tenure with Tulsa, a very brief tenure, because she's like us, they, they cut her out of there. She started noticing all these weird words and all these weird new concepts. And she came to understand that one of the mechanisms they're rolling out, again, an end run around passing the law through Congress or signing into a treaty, is they leverage tax-exempt foundations. If people study conspiracy and stuff, they're familiar with the Rockefeller Foundation and the role that they played in killing naturopathic and Eastern medicine and ushering in an era of allopathic medicine, making it seem like all that other stuff is quackery, right? They also changed the frequency of music to this, they like did studies and found, let's get the most abrasive musical frequency and let's have all the instruments tuned to that. What's up with these guys? They're the ones that are behind monocropping, too, through the Rockefeller Foundation, the advent of monocropping. It's like, we're going to feed the whole world. And really, they just destroyed the soil, so much damn soil. So they're not good guys. But these taxes and foundations, there's this new form of eco-fascism, surveillance data capitalism that's coming into play. And this is why earlier I used to think there was going to be this collapse, right? And eventually the chickens are going to come home to roost. Well, these clever fuckers... <laughs> they are creating an environment where there, I believe, is going to be a smooth transition away from the existing way of finance capitalism and all these nations in debt and individuals in debt. They're going to reset that, transition us into this new paradigm where instead of profit being a value or earnings for shareholders, they're going to roll out stakeholder capitalism where the stakeholder is everyone in the community, right? And again, that sounds like a nice peachy thing. We should be caring about the school across the street if we're running the commercial enterprise over here. But they want to dramatically shift things around. They want to turn carbon into a tradable commodity. This is already happening. They want to use their tax-exempt foundations to do what's called impact investing. So in Tulsa, Oklahoma, billionaire tax-exempt foundations invest billions of dollars in what's called a P20 pipeline, preschool to PhD. They invest, impact investing, and they say, we want to see in the future the robotics, the AI, drone industries. Drones are a big part of their thing because they want to have drones in the sky constantly surveilling everything. We want to see the drone industry thrive here <coughs> in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of all places. So we're going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars, impact investing, and we're going to make bets that the workforce through preschool, elementary school, secondary, in the Tulsa, Oklahoma University, they're going to be massaged and milked to become these pawns, essentially, for the fourth industrial revolution. And how they're going to really further that is they're actually creating financial markets where you can long and short, you can place bets on the success of this contract, of this impact investment. So there's tons of money that's coming in betting. And this is how they're shifting the way that society operates essentially right now. In Austin, there's this Austin Office of Technology, and there's another tax exempt foundation that's investing money in what's called MyPass. They're going to go to the homeless people. Again, it's all about poverty. First they roll it out for the homeless and then protect the environment. And when everyone have a blockchain digital ID, huge paradox with blockchain because it simultaneously can liberate us. It's also used to enslave the population. 
So they want to get all of the homeless folks, when they get their inoculation for the COVID vaccine, they're going to have all of their benefits on this blockchain-based ID. It's called MyPass. That's another form of impact investing. This is all taking place right now. So not only do we have to deal with the existing paradigm of terrible tyranny, which already sucked, but we have this world coming into being. And it's not just a theory, and it's not something that they could do. I believe that they will do this, and the important thing is for us to understand what they're doing, not so we can freak out or go scream, and I got the documents right here, but so we can figure out how we can strategically overcome that, insulate ourselves, and carve out our little piece of the pie. And I believe the Freedom Cell Network is a very valuable tool to do just that. Now check this out. Check, this is, here's where we come in. There's a little section here. They live different kinds of lives outside of the city. This really spoke to me, this paragraph. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city. Those we lost on the way. Those who decided that it became too much all this technology. Those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over big parts of our jobs. Those who got upset with the political system and turned against it. They live different kinds of lives outside of the city. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. Others just stayed in the empty and abandoned houses in small 19th century villages. Once in a while I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. Nowhere I can go and not to be registered. I know that somewhere everything I do, think, and dream of is recorded. That's like the neural link with Elon Musk. Um, I just hope that nobody will use it against me. So this is us. They're referring to us, right? And I'd like to think that they'll just let us do our thing. It won't be like communists line them against the wall. But who knows? We need to be prepared for both scenarios. So that's what we're facing. And now I want to share how the Freedom Cell Network can help insulate us from that. And more importantly, how the Freedom Cell Network is a better way for humans to relate to one another. We deserve better. So the Freedom Cell Network, in a nutshell, is all about small groups of people working together, I was going to use this for, but I'm just for <laughs> mutual aid, mutual defense, and achieving common goals. It's really what it's all about. There's no like agenda or initiatives, we want to rebuild all the infrastructure and stuff. It's just this blank idea. It's open source too. People can take it and run with it. And so however the Freedom Cell Network or this framework can benefit you and your community, you and your family, you and your children, People can take it and run with it however they want. So you have an inner cadre group is the core of it. This is a group of around eight people. You trust, you vetted them, family, associates, you've known them for a while. This is your little inner crew, right? You work together on common goals. That's why it's an easy pitch to this crowd, because the first four goals we always encourage people to do are to have three months of food storage. They used to say two weeks. And then COVID happened, I was like, now nah, three months, right? And for some of you guys, you're like, three months, that's nothing. But it's kind of a difficult goal, especially if you live in a 399 square foot tiny house. So strive towards three months of food storage. Everyone should have an encrypted form of communication. Telegram doesn't have group encrypted communication, I should say, although a lot of people are on it. We're not talking about overthrowing the government. I'm not an overthrow the government or smash the state kind of guy. I don't, I don't think the government's going anywhere. I'm a how can we coexist with the statists and have them stay off our backs, right? So encrypted communication. And I would say off-grid communication. It's like ham radio, some lofty goal, but here we are. Ham radio is already rocking and rolling. The guys in Tulsa are doing ham radio as well, or they're starting to do it. That's the second goal, encrypted or off-grid communication. The third goal is to have firearms and know how to use them safely and proficiently in defense of yourself, your family, and your community. You guys are already checking off all these, most everyone in the room. And then the fourth goal is to have a bug out plan. Whether you bug out with your group of eight, maybe one of them has a ranch out in South Texas or something, or you bug out separately, you just all hold each other accountable and make sure you're working on those goals. That's usually where we start with, the, with those goals. But it doesn't have to go there, right? You can have a group of families that are like, we're fed up with public schools, we wanna homeschool our kids, but we can't do it alone because we both work or whatever. So you get your eight families. It doesn't have to be eight. We'll talk about why eight in a second. And you're like, well, we're gonna chip in to buy the curriculum. Nancy and Tom are going to take lead on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Judy and Billy are going to take lead on Tuesday, Thursday, right? So that's one of the goals, buy curriculum, come up with a schedule. Every Friday we take the kids to a museum or some social outing, and then every week we do an accountability meeting with the parents to check in, see what we're doing, plan for the future week. Maybe it's a group of people that are interested in business. You can have a mastermind. We're going to go to this conference together. We're going to do this audiobook project together. 
We're going to check in with each other on our goals, so on and so forth, right? Maybe it's a health group. We're all going to do keto. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're going to jog every day. We're going to plan our diets together, right? So you can really do anything you want with the Freedom Cell Network, and the magic is this small group. So why the number eight? Well, there was a guy named John David Garcia who did a whole lot of research. Another guy was Bob Podolsky. He's more prominent in the Liberty community. This guy, John David Garcia's highest ethic was creativity. My highest ethic is freedom. And he found, through study and research with groups over like 20 years or 30 years, that eight is the optimal number of people to have maximum creativity. If you have 15 people, it starts to get bureaucratic. People aren't on the same page. They don't know one another. If you have four people, there's not enough ideas. There's not enough action. So we like to strive towards eight. It doesn't have to be eight. It could be nine. It could be seven. It really could be whatever the hell you want with it. That's just what we encourage. So you have your group of eight. You're vibing with each other. Life's better because you're working together, right? Ideally, this group is close in geographic proximity. Well, here's where we expand the network. You start encouraging other people to form these freedom cell groups, and you link up with seven other groups of eight. Now you have what we call a middle cadre, which is approximately 64 people. Or maybe you already have a big group, like around 80 people, sitting together in this cool workshop. And you can go from the bigger group, the middle cadre, how can we split up? All right, these folks are in Tennessee, these folks are in DFW, these <coughs> folks are in Arkansas. You can go from a middle cadre and then form out the groups. Maybe you don't link up necessarily on geographic proximity. Maybe you link up with the permaculture guys. I want to learn more about that. Maybe the families link up together, right? So the cool thing about the middle cadre group, one of the things that they were doing in the DFW area, they're like, let's create some trade routes. It's a big-ass metroplex. Folks that live far east, instead of going all the way to drop off the tools or the money or whatever or the contraband, <laughs> the kratom, we can meet at our friend's house in the middle. They can go pick up, right? When you have a group of 64 people, there's a lot that you can accomplish. Now here's where it goes even further. You then link up the mi middle cadre with other middle cadres and form what we call a meta cadre. So check it out. This is Texas. I should say, while this 6,000 dots does look <coughs> cool and sexy, not all of the 6,000 people are super active. A lot of people are like, I'll sign up on the website and then post a bunch of stuff and share videos. It's like, that's not what this is about, <coughs> but whatever. So imagine this is a middle cadre group in this Austin area, around 64 people. Right now we have an inner cadre group that I'm part of, and then there's a couple other that are forming. Houston area has a couple inner cadre groups, and we'll call that a middle cadre. DFW has a few inner cadre groups, so that's a middle cadre. These groups form up together to have what we call a meta cadre of around 512 people, eight groups of 64, right? The cool thing about this framework and why I think it's an innovative way for humans to organize themselves and relate to one another is that as the network scales in number, it remains horizontal. So the way that our government, the way that the government, not my government, I don't like to be part of it unless I'm coerced into participating. That's why I don't vote. My policy is like, if they force me to do something or I'm under threat or it's gonna like inconvenience me to get pulled over because I don't have tags, maybe I'll consider complying. But if, I, if, I, if I, there's no consequences, I guess someone can say, well, Joe Biden's the consequence, but whatever. Yeah, that's your fault. Right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. They're both chumps. Tr Trump's a chump, too. It's just a different flavor. Chump. Orange. <laughs> Orange soda. Cheeto flavor. So the cool thing is, well, the system that we have, that the system that's in place now is centralized and vertical, not horizontal. There's a group of people up here that have a whole lot of power. Then they have the Congress, then they have the bureaucrats, of course the central bankers, the international bankers, and the secret shadowy elite are really the ones that are pulling the puppets. And then the people, the peons, are way down at the bottom. It's totally vertical. This network can grow, can make large-scale decisions, can pull together resources and money, can communicate in emergency situations effectively to aid one another, and as it grows, it remains horizontal. So for example, Let's say in Austin, we have an inner cadre group. That's all we got. Everyone that joins becomes a part of the inner cadre group in the beginning, and then we split off. Well, now we have around 64 people. So, okay, there's more people. Let's organize ourselves into these eight groups of eight. Well, now more people join the city of Austin. 
essentially just stretches out. There's this biological term, autopoiesis, which is like a cell that replicates itself and continues to keep that form. So as you grow in the city of Austin, now we just have a metacadre group, right? And the cool thing is, your intercadre group, you're super closely connected. But just because you're not as connected as you are with the intercadre group to the middle cadre group doesn't mean that you're still not connected or you still don't have a telegram group where you keep in touch. It's just these are the guys maybe you all meet weekly or you touch base weekly. The group of 64, you touch base monthly, for example. Or maybe annually, we get the whole state of Texas together for our, inter for our meta cadre group, right? And then eventually, as we expand, and again, one of the things that I've been doing as I got back involved is trying to do conference calls, events. We did one in Spavanaugh, Oklahoma, Houston, Austin. This is considered a freedom cell talk, right? We're having these little summits. I want to focus on organizing the network into this infrastructure. Whenever you have multiple meta cadres linked up, I like to call it the confederation of freedom cells, right? Now let me talk about some of the cool stuff that we can do. On the defensive end, this big technocracy, that's what the elites want to create, a technocracy. It means rule through technology and rule by experts. It's this concept that came about in the 30s and the 40s as a reaction to the Depression. And all these scientists and experts are like, politicians really suck at governing. We should govern, right? If anyone's heard of resource-based economy and that stuff, this is essentially what that is. Well, the technocracy wants to leverage technology in order to control people. And one of the things that we see on the horizon, it's not a conspiracy theory, is a COVID immunity passport. All right, Bill Gates did this Reddit thing, and he does these interviews. It's like, well, we, if we want, before we go back to the new normal, then we're going to have to have these digital immunity certificates. Yep. Somebody was poking fun at me because I always talk with my hands. And they're like, that's just what Bill Gates does. <laughs> and his last name's Bush. Wait a second. <laughs> you know, how many people are still like, oh, I like what you're saying, but your last name's Bush, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, great, come on now. <laughs> yeah, if I'm a Fed, we're all fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in Texas. Although, misnomer, Bush is never from Texas. He was from Connecticut. He's the leader's from Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, what the, uh, no offense to anyone in Connecticut, uh, what, but yes offense to those of us in Texas. What, uh, what they want to do, the, the, so the thought of a mandatory vaccine for COVID always gets talked about, but I don't think that's their path. Really, the law journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, they say we shouldn't do a mandatory vaccine because if you put a penalty on it or a crime, that could elicit problems in the courts when people stand up and fight against it. So instead, what we should do, essentially what they want to do is take away what they see as privileges. So there's already something called the Common Pass, which is what the World Economic Forum is behind. Gates is invested in it, the, the Rockefellers, the Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We already see in California, Ticketmaster is working on Common Pass technology to where before you go to a concert, you have to prove that you had a negative test in the past few days or you have your COVID vaccine certificate. We also see airlines like Delta and some of these conglomerations are starting to experiment with this technology. We also have talk of you can't work with your employer unless you have a COVID immunity pass, green light. This is taking place already in China and Singapore. They're starting to roll it out in the UK already. So essentially what they want to do is compel people to obey with their edicts and what they want us to do by taking away privileges. Blockchain technology works a lot in this. You have your digital identity at birth. That's how you buy and sell, Mark of the Beast style. They can turn that off. But also, they send tokens. So if you're green lit to travel on public transportation, big part of Agenda 21, they want to disincentivize and ultimately eliminate private, private automobiles. Because when you're cruising, right, somebody I was talking to has got the Corvette from Illinois. Yeah. That's a free man right there driving down the highway. <laughs> you, know, you can turn left, you can turn right, you can stop to pee, you can do whatever the hell you want. Right? Unless there's border checkpoints. Thank God we don't have internal border checkpoints yeah. yet. Yeah. Not yet. But if you're if they do away with the automobile, you're forced into public transportation to go visit your grandma or go to work, then they can say, Oh, he his social credit score dipped below sixty, right? We rank your social credit score forty out of hundred. So they send in a token that says you're not authorized to travel public transportation. Or you're not authorized to travel to these places. You can only go to work or whatever. That's what we're facing. The Freedom Cell Network aims to create an environment 
where, for example, if they say you don't have your green light on your COVID Common Pass app, so you can't go to the grocery store. It's like, I've been to the grocery store in six months. We created our own resilient food network. This guy's got the ducks over here. This guy's got the garden over here. We got the seed bank over here. We got the permaculture expert in the back. We don't go to the grocery store, right? We want to create an environment where it's difficult and impossible for them to compel us into complying with their bullshit. Same thing. Oh, well, I have a big job with a big corporation. We were talking about the mask stuff and all the HR stuff, right? It's like, well, they can go to the big corporation and say, unless they have the COVID pass, unless they have this credit score or that, then they can't be employed. We have our own agorist network of people working together. We hire one another. Many of us are entrepreneurs. We have our own trade. We have our own Monero or digital currency they can't shut off. That's what this is all about. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. But as I said earlier, it's not just about a defensive posture, which is important. More importantly, it's about how can we live in a manner that's more in line with our free sovereignty, our, our freedom as, as free human beings. But there's a lot of overlap. So when we talk about mandatory vaccine, Jack often brings up well, one of the mechanisms that they can use is they'll increase your insurance premiums if you don't have COVID immunity or take the vaccine, which makes sense from a business perspective, right? Also from a diabolical Illuminati perspective, it makes sense. But how about this? I personally have a health share. It's called Zion Health Share. It costs $208. If there's an emergency, it's covered 100%, except I pay out of pocket up to 1000 bucks. It's like $1,000 deductible. This works for me. I don't have chronic ailments. I don't even have an MD. I don't have a primary care physician. I go to my naturopath. I don't take pharmaceuticals, right? So it's a good thing for me. So what I would like to do, and what we can do with this network, let's imagine that we have 10,000 people organized in the Freedom Cell Network, and they're all part of the inter cadre, middle cadre, meta cadre framework. Well, there's a way that we can make decisions based on consensus without having a congressperson have to vote on our behalf or whatever. So let's say we have 10,000 people the health insurance sucks anyway, besides this pressure point, right? It's totally bloated. It was before Obamacare. Now it's even worse. Trump ain't going to fix it if he gets in again. And so we can have our group of 10,000. We can say, you know what? I think that we've scaled to the point where we can all contribute and we can form our own health share company. Whether we go ahead and do it legit and form an LLC or a corporation, a legal entity that the members own, maybe it's cooperative, or we do a smart contract, agorist based one, whatever. That's something to decide. It might be better to do it a legit style, I don't know. But we can then go to the network and someone can say, hey, I have an idea, I'd like to do this, here's the proposal, who wants to get on board? And then you send out the message alert system to the network and everyone essentially votes. We want to participate, we're willing to contribute X dollars a month and now we're like, wow, this is a viable idea. We can essentially create our own health share. So what we're doing is becoming self-sufficient from the government, right? Another thing that we can do when we reach a good-sized number, this is when I lose some people, but I don't think I'll lose this crowd. In the New Libertarian Manifesto by Samuel Everett Conkin, this was the first iteration of agorism, revolutionary market anarchism. It talks about these different phases of agorist society. Phase zero is zero-density agorism, 100% statism. Right? Phase one is small little isolated pockets of agorists, and everything else is status, right? And as you transition, there becomes bigger agorist cadres, even since there's agorist ghettos, right? And there's all these, imagine a bunch of eco-villages and intentional communities. And, you know, Samuel Overcon can pass away, but I think he would be really excited and, and happy to see what's grown out of agorism, right? I think Jack Spearco was probably a huge, like, agorisms like this, and then Jack starts talking about it. It's like, boop, 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 Because it's still a pretty little niche thing, right? Not, it's not very mainstream at all, but it's going to be. And so he talked about... Whenever you have phase one, phase zero density or phase one density, you don't want to go toe to toe using violence against the state, right? He's, he's not an offensive guy. I'm not an offensive guy. I'm not a overthrow. I'm not a let's get the militia and go monitor the vote or like let's go toe to toe at the Congress building. It's not like that. That's not what this is about. But he does say when it comes to defense, we could have private defense agencies. So instead of Obviously, the first line of defense is everyone being armed, knowing how to use the arms safely and proficiently, right? Not just having a gun, but knowing how to use it. 
But the next line of defense is, just as we polled the network of 100,000, does everyone want to contribute to a health share program? We poll the network and say, does everyone want to contribute to a private security agency? Or let's say here in, or here in Austin, obviously it's good to be local. We have 6,000 people. Half of them decided they want to contribute to private security that comes in and checks on them that you can call. Instead of calling 911, you call the agorist number for our private security that we've hired, right? Now, this all, you, maybe there's a national company that we get a premium and there's little pockets, the pockets that have developed to the point where they can afford it, where they're ready to take that leap, right? And now, here's where this comes into play. When we have a good enough number of people and we have private security, private security would certainly help. It's not necessary. That's when we're like, you know what? How about we pull the network of a million people, which isn't unfathomable, and we say, are you guys ready to declare your independence from the state together, collectively at the same time? And we all opt out. Opt out of paying the property tax, opt out of the income tax, all the regulation, right? Doesn't have to go this far. Again, this is where I lose some people. There could be the inner cadre that's the knitting club, and you don't have to get all hardcore with the private security and opting out, right? But I like to envision things and help to manifest them, so that's where I'm going in my head. I want to see that we have a strong enough group of people where we can opt out. And get this, the whole time, we're not like the sketchy weirdos living out in the shack and like marching through town with our paramilitary gear. No, we're active members of the community. We sell ducks to the restaurant down the street. We do, when there's a hurricane, our group and our organization goes and helps and aids, right? We're embedded in the network. We're not weirdos, we're not violent, we're not crazy. Techno We're the techno Amish, the techno Amish. <laughs> and so the beauty of it is, it may not even be that we have to formally opt out. It could be that over the course of the next years, we've de facto opted out. Because not only have we built our own health care systems and health insurance, health shares, and defense, and we have the older wise folks that form a tribunal arbitrary council that help us negotiate and settle conflicts and disputes, right? And we have our own food production systems, and we have our own homeschool cooperatives and unschools and all sorts of other things. We essentially haven't been participating in the system for quite some time. It's just that leap with the property tax, obviously, is a big one, as is the income tax. So it's all about taking steps to get from here to there. And that's something that's been really important for me. So that's what the Freedom Cell Network is all about. Again, the status quo right now is pretty fucking terrible. And it's not something I want my children to grow up in. I want them to experience freedom that I never experienced. They don't have social security numbers, so they got a leg up on me. So that's a good start for them. But not only is stuff terrible now, and the, the status quo of this federal government, and state governments, and all this communism creeping in, that's really bad. But as I talked about Agenda 21 and the Great Reset and this panopticon surveillance society, that's going to happen. So I want to invite you guys to join myself, join the network, help us grow this network so we can carve out our little area outside of the city without being crushed by the man. That's my presentation. So we got like 12 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, thoughts, and then we don't have to do it now because I know there's another talk. Um, but I'd love for Nicole set up a Tennessee group. There's a Texas group. Um, I'd like for us to talk. We're, this group's already connected and network, but I'd like if you guys would consider joining the website, linking up with the existing. There's 6,000 people, and these are all like-minded people. It's libertarians. There's even libertarian party people. There's permaculture people. There's agorists. There's crypto, cypherpunks, it's a great conglomeration of people, and uh, you, I think you guys could really add a lot of value to the network, and I think the network could add a lot of value to you. So I'm going to drop those groups in the Telegram chat for this event, and then if there's someone in Arkansas or Illinois or wherever, if there's not yet a Telegram chat group for your area, I invite you to create one, and then let's share it with each other. And then again, you go to freedomcells.org, put an address down the street, and see if there's already some existing action in your area. If you live in a de densely populated area, chances are there's already some people that are there. There may already be some existing cells. Yes? One of the last things you just said was very interesting. When you said your children had a leg up on you because they did not have social security numbers. How, how did you do that? 
Well, they were both birthed at home. Repeat the question. So we just, yeah. oh, the question was, how did we do no social security numbers for the kids? It's really like, how did we not do it? We just didn't do anything. <laughs> so there's no requirement that you have to have a social. And it's funny, because I was telling my dad and stuff that he's with it. He worked at my bookstore that I operated for a little while and like had all these crazy conspiracy theories, gab at him for, for two years. But he's like, John, I don't think that's what if they need to open a bank account or whatever. And I always said, this is back in 2010, 2011, when my first child was born, you know, by the time they come of age where they're ready to do business and commerce, there's going to be some kind of radical currency that we've created where they don't have to have a bank or a social. Bitcoin already existed at that point. I hadn't heard about it yet, but a couple years later, I was like, well, there it is right there. They don't need a social to do business. And here's the thing, it's a very low-risk activity. If the kids are like, you and mom are fucking weird, dad. Why are y'all so obsessed with this freedom stuff? I just want to have a normal life. My daughter says that sometimes when we're like, we're not wearing the mask and, and we're going to s- sneak around stuff with all this bullshit COVID stuff. And I tell them I have a medical exemption. My daughter's like, can't we just have a normal life? And I was like, if you had a normal life, you'd be vaccinated, you'd be in public school, yada, yada, you know. We're going to be able to take these random trips in the middle of the week to Universal Studios, you know. So, uh, but if they, if they want to have a social, they can get a social when they're 12 or 15 or 16. Yeah. And that's the beauty of this network. So maybe it's like, well, there are some banks or credit unions that don't require social. Federally, the social security number is only supposed to be used for social security, right? This big giant Ponzi scheme. But as we grow our agorist network, maybe my kids never have to do business with the status great reset network. They're outside of that system doing business with you guys, right? The, the more people we have that are of like mind participating in this manner, the more resilient the network becomes, the more opportunity there is to not participate with the existing paradigm. Yes? Besides word of mouth and groups like this, how are you marketing or where are you on the social media platforms or somewhere that's getting the word out or marketing this idea? Well, Derek, who's familiar with Derek Rose and the Conscious Resistance Network? This guy's a freaking machine, and he has a huge network and a huge following, and he's growing it, doing interviews on the Corbett Report, familiar with James Corbett. Uh, myself, I'm pounding away on my podcast. I did an interview with Tom.